We must, therefore, be vigilant that human rights discourse not be corrupted or hijacked or used for dubious or malignant purposes. On July 8, 2019, Mike Pompeo made this remark among a number of the more interesting or sensational prepared statements in the press briefing room of the White House. And while we will get into those statements, this one in particular set my nerves screaming due to my recent re-immersion into the crisis at the border. So let me begin with a plea to support races, or to sign up for five calls, or to watch my previous video, Concentration Camps on the Border, if you haven't. Without further ado, let's get into it. First, as usual, we need to define our terms, specifically human rights. Although I know it won't be sufficient, let's look at a dictionary definition. According to Webster's, it is rights such as freedom from unlawful imprisonment, torture, and execution regarded as belonging fundamentally to all persons. While this is a decent place to jump off from, this definition is at once both too vague and too specific to be an adequate end to our discussion. According to the United Nations, they are rights inherent to all human beings, whatever our nationality, place of residence, sex, national or ethnic origin, color, religion, language, or any other status. We are all equally entitled to our human rights without discrimination. These rights are all interrelated, interdependent, and indivisible. That is a much more inclusive definition, but still lacks an explanation of what human rights are. Let's stick a pin in that, we will be coming back to it. Now, according to most historians, the first instance of human rights being known as human rights was sometime at either the end of the 17th or the beginning of the 18th century. Through the centuries, the concept has morphed a little, but by the end of World War II, it had become clear that some sort of statement by countries to which they all had to agree to and sign was needed. No longer would your place of birth or residence determine how you should be treated. But now, we have Mike Pompeo telling us that because some rights clash with other rights, we need to make a new determination about which rights should take precedence over other rights. This is complete bull, but it continues the strategy begun under Nikki Haley, one that reminds me of nothing more than putting your hands over your ears and claiming, nanny nanny boo boo, I can't hear you. It's stupid. So let's get into the substance of what he said, because if he were to state it plainly, our reaction would be much more visceral. But since he phrased it in such high-minded words, most of us let it go by with nary a thought. And that's exactly what he wants. Good morning, everyone. In my address at the Claremont Institute back in May, called A Foreign Policy from the Founding, I made clear that the Trump administration has embarked on a foreign policy that takes seriously the founders' ideas of individual liberty and constitutional government. Those principles have long played a prominent role in our country's foreign policy, and rightly so. But as that great admirer of the American experiment, Alex de Tocqueville, noted, democracies have a tendency to lose sight of the big picture in the hurly-burly of everyday affairs. Every once in a while, we need to step back and reflect seriously on where we are, where we've been, and whether we're headed in the right direction. And that's why I'm pleased to announce today the formation of a Commission on Unalienable Rights. In this first paragraph, he doesn't say much that would be out of line with typical political thought on either side of the aisle. It's true that democracies do sometimes get caught up in day-to-day -day affairs and require a step back to regain the perspective needed to make decisions about the overall state of our country. And I find nothing that he says to be beyond the pale. I do take a little issue with his name for his re-examination, but that will come up again. Upon closer examination, there is one objectionable comment, but it is only to be expected from a White House that makes people take a pledge of loyalty. Anything said by anyone who is in this administration about this administration should be taken as suspect until it can be proven true. Let's go to the second paragraph. The commission is composed of human rights experts, philosophers and activists, Republicans, Democrats and independents of varied backgrounds and beliefs who will provide me with advice on human rights grounded on our nation's founding principles and the principles of the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. An American commitment to uphold human rights played a major role in transforming the moral landscape of the international relations after World War II, something all Americans can rightly be proud of. Under the leadership of Eleanor Roosevelt, the 1948 Universal Declaration on Human Rights ended forever the notion that nations could abuse their citizens without attracting notice or repercussions. 
The second paragraph is where he starts deviating from best practices. He tells us that his inputs will be varied due to the sheer breadth of people he is engaging. In fact, there is reason to think that the result of all of this will be to simply reaffirm the misogynistic, racist, and jingoist policies that the Trump administration already has espoused. According to PBS NewsHour, two out of the ten people chosen to be on the commission have previously praised a number of countries who were cited by the State Department for human rights abuses, including Saudi Arabia and the UAE. And did you notice how he makes it seem as if a whole bunch more than just 10 would be participating? Although he does tell us later that it will only be 10, at the beginning it seems like a lot more. Additionally, there is this from Just Security. But what is the commission likely to advise Pompeo? Given Pompeo's statements on the setting up of the commission, the Trump administration's stance on human rights, and the track records of the commission's new chair and a number of its other members, not to mention Pompeo himself, the risk is high that the commission will advance a specific brand of conservative arguments aimed at a. Dialing back gains on LGBTQI rights and women's rights, including particularly the right to choose and the right to marriage equality. b. Deprioritizing fundamental economic, social, and cultural rights. And c. Supporting long-standing U.S. hypocrisy on human rights, namely using rights to attack opponents while reinterpreting rights to avoid criticism of the United States record at home and abroad. We will get into the woman who is leading the commission a little bit later, but suffice it to say that she's got more than a couple of problematic issues in her closet. Also, he says that he will be provided with advice on human rights, but there is zero indication one way or the other as to whether he is entailed to follow said advice. The only other thing of the note is his invocation of Eleanor Roosevelt to say that no country thereafter would be able to deprive people of their human rights without attracting notice or repercussions. And that is the core of my objection to the UDHR. It has very little in the way of enforcement. Pompeo's objections center on something else entirely, but we will get to that a little later. Now comes the third paragraph. With the indispensable support of President Ronald Reagan, a human rights revolution toppled the totalitarian regimes of the former Soviet Union. Today, the language of human rights has become the common vernacular for discussions of human freedom and dignity all around the world, and these are truly great achievements. Disregarding the blatant lie that it was a human rights revolution that toppled the Soviet Union, the only other thing he mentions in his third paragraph is about the language of human rights but he offers little more than a bit of pablum before he gets to the real purpose of this commission. Paragraph 4 But we should never lose sight of the warnings of Vaclav Havel, a hero of the late 20th century human rights movement that worked like rights can be used for good or evil. They can be rays of light in a realm of darkness, but they can also be lethal arrows. And as Rabbi Jonathan Sachs has observed, the evils of any time and place will be justified in whatever is the dominant discourse of that time and of that place. We must therefore be vigilant that human rights discourse not be corrupted or hijacked or used for dubious or malignant purposes. It is awfully telling that Pompeo felt the need to bring the cachet of Vaclav Havel while intentionally misleading his audience about what Havel was actually talking about. Here is the quote from Goodreads. The point I am trying to make is that words are a mysterious, ambiguous, ambivalent, and perfidious phenomenon. They can be rays of light in a realm of darkness, they can equally be lethal arrows. Worst of all, at times they can be one or the other. They can even be both at once. Hmm. Pompeo takes one line from this quote and asserts that words like rights are what Havo was talking about. Get a little more context and you realize that he was talking about all words and making an observation that the words themselves can be either or both evil and good depending on how you use them. But according to Pompeo's logic, there is only one word that has that kind of flexibility, rights. He's an extremely polished and deliberate speaker, so it can be assumed that the misrepresentation of Havel's thoughts is something of which he was well aware. And while I don't know enough about Rabbi Sachs, this is where Pompeo directly sticks his foot in it. I honestly don't know of a more pressing and immediate need than at the border at this moment, but this administration is corrupting human rights language to be used to keep immigrants and asylum seekers in cages. I'm sorry, but how are we supposed to take anything this administration has to say seriously when you are guilty of human rights abuses? So now we get to the fifth paragraph in his prepared remarks. 
It's a sad commentary on our times that more than 70 years after the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, gross violations continue throughout the world, sometimes even in the name of human rights. International institutions designed and built to protect human rights have drifted from their original mission. As human rights claims have proliferated, some claims have come into tension with one another, provoking questions and clashes about which rights are entitled to gain respect. Nation states and international institutions remain confused about their respective responsibilities concerning human rights. The fifth paragraph is one of blathering bull. Plain and simple. The first sentence is the only one which has a whiff of truth because it would be a sad commentary if eliminating those abuses were the point of having a universal declaration of human rights. But it's not. There is little the UN or the international community can do, honestly, in the face of human rights abuses. However, not one of these countries can make the claim that they didn't know these are human rights abuses, and the international community knows it as well. So, for instance, in the 80s, when countries around the world finally stood up to South Africa and its policy of apartheid, the UDHR had no mechanism for enforcement, but its principles still guided us as far as what we were to stand against. Well, almost everyone. St. Ronnie vetoed sanctions on South Africa. I'm certain he had good reasons to let human rights abuses continue. As to the rest of it, I'm positive that there have been instances of rights clashing or providing tension in one another. But the other thing I'm absolutely sure of is that none of these contributed to any sort of dereliction of institutional responsibilities. The one thing we can be sure of with this administration is that it will lie, even when it doesn't have to. To be honest, it is only because of efforts by people like Mohammed bin Salman, Erdogan, and you that any confusion surrounds questions of human rights. With that, let's read the sixth paragraph. With that as background, and with all of this in mind, the time is right for an informed review of the role of human rights in American foreign policy. And I'm pleased to introduce to you today the chair of the commission, Professor Mary Ann Glendon, the learned hand professor of law at Harvard Law School. Mary Ann is a well-known author, beloved professor, and expert in the field of human rights, comparative law, and political theory. She's the perfect person to chair this effort. Yeah, no. Now we get to one of my major sticking points, the identity of the person chosen by Pompeo, Mary Ann Glendon. To hear Pompeo tell it, Mary Ann is the very soul of benevolent wisdom and perspicacity. Nothing could be further from the truth. Just a casual glance at her Wikipedia page tells us that she is very much anti-choice, anti-contraception, and anti-LGBTQ. According to the Washington Blade, America's LGBT news source, Glendon, in an article, wrote, What same-sex marriage advocates have tried to present as a civil rights issue is really a bid for special preferences of the type our society gives to married couples for the very good reason that most of them are raising or have raised children. She also said marriage rights for same-sex couples suggest alternative family forms are just as good as a husband and wife raising kids together. Hmm. I also find the fact that she was described as Pompeo's mentor a little bit troubling, but only because of the steady diet of ultra-right-wing crap coming out of his mouth. As to the rest of the members, I have read about two members, Berman and Hansen, who praise the governments of Saudi Arabia and the UAE, but little else. Knowing the political views of both Pompeo and Glennon, do we expect that the commission will find the treatment of humans at the border anything but excusable, regardless of the opinions of the other members? You've got to be kidding me. I, for example, find that the real problem with human rights is that although we can clearly identify where human rights abuses are taking place, there are no teeth in the UDHR to force nations to comply. I'm betting that isn't the problem that Pompeo and Glennon have with human rights. My bet is that with all of his talk about natural law, he thinks even the 30 outlined in the, in the UDHR are far too many. Anyone want to take me up on that bet? The list of human rights will be in the description and finishes the definition from the UN I brought up in the beginning. I ask you, how many of these is the Trump administration guilty of violating? Might that be the reason for all of this? Do I really need to tell you the answers? Just in case, it's a bunch and duh. The rest of his short speech is fairly unremarkable except for one paragraph in which he asks questions such as, what does it mean to say or claim that something is, in fact, a human right? I'm going to leave you with this from a New York Times writer, Roger Cohen. 
There is no need to reinvent the wheel, Mr. Secretary. A lot of bipartisan and international consensus consolidated over the post-war decades in the aftermath of the Holocaust and other horrors exists as to what human rights are and what America's role in defending them should be. Your attempts to change the way we think about human rights is both transparent and pathetic. Regardless, that's all I've got for today. Every time I went a layer deeper in this subject, my instinctive revulsion grew exponentially. <sighs> and I think this might not even be the end of it. Anyway, if you'd be interested in seeing more of my content and to always be notified of anything new I put out, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. If you like this video, please hit like. If not, you know what to do. And please leave a comment below. If you'd like to help me continue improving my channel, please consider visiting my Patreon page and becoming a patron for as little as $1 monthly. Or to my PayPal account for a one-time donation. You can find me on Twitter or Facebook under the name Panic Clown. As usual, my Discord and Instagram pages are up, but still underutilized. Catch you on the flip side.